Welcome everyone to Too Good to Be True. Thank you for taking the time to listen. The subject of today's show is King Tut's tomb and two other famous urban legends. Before we start getting into detail, let's just briefly talk about psychic insight and how we apply it. We choose a subject, then research the background, and based on that research, we determine what we think needs to be explained by creating a series of questions. Then Justina provides psychic insight to answer those questions. The psychic insight is narrated towards the end of the show. Accepting the psychic insight is a question of individual belief. Now let's go through the disclaimers. Here are the disclaimers. Neither of us claim to have any expertise in any subjects that we discuss. We relate information we find through research and the psychic insight. We are always delighted to hear from the listeners. The show only lasts an hour. We don't have the time to present exhaustive research on any topic. This means that there will be information that that we miss. We want to provide a basis for the psychic insight. We don't care if a theory turns out too good to be true, as the show name suggests. We are only interested in finding out more of the truth about topics. Spirit can only relate insight that is appropriate for our time in history. Free will cannot be affected. Only comments that are appropriate for our time can be given through the psychic insight. Much of the subject matter in shows may have already been covered many times in other media. We want to look into subjects in a new, different way and be thought-provoking. We are not so good with pronouncing names, we apologize, and neither of us have any particular knowledge of urban legends or associated subjects. If we have misstated anything, we apologize. Today's subject was entirely based on a listener's suggestion, so a shout-out goes to the listener who suggested King Tut's Tomb, James Dean's car, and the Hope Diamond. Starting with King Tut's tomb, the following is from the Live Science website, and I quote, Among the world's most famous curses is the curse of the pharaoh, also known as King Tut's curse. Ever since King Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, stories circulated that those who dared violate the boy's king's final resting place faced a terrible curse, end quote. The curse of the pharaoh allegedly came to pass in the early 20th century when major discoveries were, ma- were being made in Egypt. So where was King Tut's tomb besides being in Egypt? Tutankhamun's tomb is located in the Valley of the Kings on the west bank of the Nile opposite Luxor, where the tombs of her pharaohs and nobles were, were cut from rock. Tutankhamun's tomb was not located inside the pyramid. I don't know how I got the idea that the pyramids were always used for the burial of pharaohs. How was Tutankhamun's tomb found? In 1907, George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, hired Howard Carter to work on the excavation of tombs. Here's part of a Wikipedia article describing the discovery. Quote, in 1914, Lord Carnarvon received a concession to dig in the Valley of the Kings. Carter was again employed to lead the work. However, excavations and study were soon inter- and study were soon interrupted by the First World War. Carter spending these year these war years working for the British government as a diplomatic courier and translator. He enthusiastically resumed his excavation work towards the end of 1917. In 1922, Lord Carnarvon had become dissatis- dissatisfied with the lack of results after several years of finding little. He informed Carter they had one more season of funding to make a significant find in the Valley of the Kings. On November the 4th, 1922, Carter's excavation group found steps that Carter hoped led to Tutankhamun's tomb, and he wired Lord Carnarvon to come to Egypt. On the 26th of November, 1922, Carter made a tiny breach in the top left-hand corner of the doorway, with Carnarvon, his daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert, and others in attendance, using a chisel that his grandmother had given him for his 17th birthday. He was able to peer it by the light of a candle and see that many of the gold and ebony treasures were still in place. He did not yet know whether it was a tomb or merely a cache, but he did see a promising sealed doorway between two sentinel statues. Carnarvon asked, can you say anything? Carter replied with the famous words, yes, wonderful things, unquote. So what happened after the discovery of the tomb? The Wikipedia article continues. The next several months were spent cataloguing the contents of the antechamber under the often stressful supervision of Pierre Lacau, Director General of the Department of 
of Antiquities of Egypt. On 16th of February 1923, Carter opened a sealed doorway and found that it did indeed lead to a burial chamber, and he got his first glimpse of the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun. The tomb was considered the best preserved and most intact pharaonic tomb ever found in the Valley of the Kings, and its discovery was eagerly covered by the world's press. But most of their representatives were kept in their hotels, much to their annoyance. Only H.V. Morton of the Times was allowed on the scene, and his vivid descriptions helped to cement Carter's reputation with the British public, unquote. So did the curse of the pharaohs become a reality? Here is a list of unfortunate deaths following the discovery of the tomb in 1922, based on several sources, including the website Mental Floss. Lord Carnarvon tore open a mosquito bite while shaving and ended up dying of blood poisoning. There is a legend that all the lights in the house went out when he died. Sir Bruce Ingham, who Carter, who Howard Carter apparently gave a paperweight consisting of a mummified hand from King Tut's tomb, had his house burned to the ground. When he tried to rebuild, the house was hit with a flood. Apparently, the mummified hand wore a bracelet with the words when translated, Cursed be he who moves my body. George J. Gold, a wealthy American financier and railroad executive, visited the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1923 and died of pneumonia a few months later. Aubrey Herbert, half-brother to the Earl of Carnarvon, died of blood poisoning after a tooth extraction only five months after the death of his half-brother. Hugh Evelyn White, a British archaeologist who had visited Tut's tomb, hung himself in 1924. By then, about 24 of his fellow excavators had already died. Apparently, he wrote a note including the following, I've succumbed to a curse which forces me to disappear. Aaron Ember died in 1926 when his house in Baltimore burned down. He could have exited safely, but his wife encouraged him to save his manuscript, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, while she fetched their son. Sadly, they and the family's maid died in the catastrophe. Richard Bethel, the Earl of Carnarvon's secretary in 1929, was found dead by smothering in his room at an elite London gentleman's club. This apparently followed a series of mysterious fires in his home which stored some of the priceless artefacts from the tomb. And finally, Sir Archibald Douglas Reed, who x-rayed the mummy, got sick and died three days later. Lord Carnarvon died in April of 1923, four months and seven days after the opening of the tomb. So what happened to Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon's daughter, Lady Evelyn Hubert, the other two present for the opening of the tomb? Howard Carter died in March of 1939, age 64, from Hodgkin's disease. He died without an official honour. He did not become Sir Howard Carter for services to archaeology. Lady Evelyn Herbert lived until 1980, dying at the age of 79. Her remains are buried in the same cemetery as those of Howard Carter in Putney Vale, London, England. I think it's time to change subjects to James Dean's car. Yes, James Dean, aged only 24, died in a traffic accident in September of 1955. At the time of his death, James Dean had only made three movies. After the movie Rebel Without Cause was released, James Dean became an icon, representing misunderstood rebellious youth. In that 1950s diner, you like going to his pictures on the wall, which I guess proves the point. Yes, any self-respecting 1950s establishment would have pictures of James T. and Marilyn Monroe. On the subject of restaurants, I recall the story when actor Alec Guinness had warned James Dean not to drive his car. Guinness played the character Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original Star Wars movies. Here is part of an account from the British television chat show Parkinson from 1977. The narrative starts when Dean follows Guinness outside a crowded restaurant to offer Guinness a seat at his table. Quote, There in the courtyard of this little restaurant was this little silver thing, very smart, all done up in cellophane with a bunch of roses tied to its bonnet, Guinness told Parkinson, adding that he'd asked how fast it could go. Dean replied it would do 150 miles per hour. I said, have you driven it? And he said, no, I've never been in it at all. Guinness said, and some strange thing came over me, some almost different voice, and I said, Look, I won't join your table unless you want me to, but I must say something. 
please do not get into that car because if you do, and I looked at my watch and I said, if you get into that car at all, it's now Thursday, well, Friday actually, 10 o'clock at night, and by 10 o'clock at night next Thursday, you'll be dead if you get into that car, unquote. Uh, bonnet is another word for hood, while cellophane is an old-fashioned clear plastic wrapping material. The car's VIN or vehicle identification number was 5500055. The premonition was pretty chilling, but how did the actual crash occur? James Dean was a race car driver as well as a movie actor. He was on his way to an auto rally in his new car when the accident happened. I'll start a quote from an article uh, from the uh, ThoughtCo website. Quote, on September 30th, 1955, James Dean was driving his new Porsche 550 Spider to an auto rally in Salinas, California, when the fatal accident occurred. Originally planning to tow the Porsche to the rally, Dean changed his mind at the last minute and decided to drive the Porsche instead. But I think we'll have to go into the break, Justina. Yes, we'll continue with how the accident with James Dean occurred and the Hope Diamond after this short break. And you're listening to Too Good to Be True with Justina Marsh and Pete Marsh on the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. <laughs> Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, sci-fi, and horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. We live in rapidly shifting times of extreme volatility and uncertainty. Such profound change brings a unique opportunity for the evolution of consciousness. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio Show, a program that explores the latest scientific developments and deepening spiritual truths supporting human evolution. Join me on xzbn.net, where I interview leading experts in science, physics, medicine, spirituality, and more. By applying divergent viewpoints to leading-edge topics, we uncover expansive and evolutionary truth to assist you on your path to enlightenment. More information and past episodes are available at missionevolution.org. Welcome back to 
good to be true. And before the break, we were discussing James Dean and the unfortunate accident that happened. So, Dad, can you please continue quoting from the Thought Co. website? Yes, um, Dean was uh, on his way to a auto rally in Salinas, California. I'll pick up the quote. While Dean and Rolf Wutherick, Dean's mechanic, rode in the Porsche, Dean had photographer Sanford Roth and friend Bill Hickman follow him in a, his Ford station wagon, which had a trailer for the spider attached. En route to Salinas, Dean was pulled over by police officers near Bakersfield for speeding around 3.30 p.m. After being stopped, Dean and Wutherick continued on their way. Two hours later, around 5.30 p.m., they were driving westbound on Highway 466, now called State Road 46, when a 1950 Ford Tutor pulled out in front of them. 23-year-old Don Donald Turnip Seed, who was driving the Ford Tudor, had been traveling east on Highway 466 and was attempting to make a left turn onto Highway 41. Unfortunately, Turnip Seed had already started to make his turn before he saw the roaring Porsche traveling quickly towards him. Without time to turn, the two cars smashed nearly head on. The injuries among the three involved in the crash varied greatly. Turnip Seed, the driver of the Ford, only received minor injuries from the accident. Rolf Wutherick, the passenger in the Porsche, was lucky to be thrown from the Porsche and thus suffered serious head injuries and a broken leg but survived the crash, unquote. Airbags weren't a requirement until 1991. 1950s cars didn't have seat belts or crumple zones to absorb energy from crashes. Cars then were very dangerous by today's standards. So Dean's car was totaled. Was that the end of the story? No, the story continues like a Stephen King novel. Here's a part of an article from the website Snopes, which is dedicated to fact-checking. Snopes cites an unnamed newspaper article for the following, quote, After the accident, the Porsche was sold to a second-hand dealer who put it on public view, supposedly in support of a campaign for road safety. safety. He charged viewers 25 cents each to look at it. Car designer George Barris next bought the car and planned to sell it for parts. When the car was delivered to his yard, it rolled back off the truck and broke a mechanic's legs. Troy McHenry, a Beverly Hills doctor, bought the Dean engine and used it to replace the engine in his Porsche. The doctor was killed in a crash the first time he took the car out. Uh, Troy McHenry died on the 22nd of October 1956 during an automobile race, automobile race at the Panoma Fairground near Los Angeles. He was driving a Porsche Spider, but I've yet to determine if Dean's engine was in the car. Another unnamed doctor bought the Dean's transmission. He was... He, too, was later seriously injured in a car crash. An unnamed New Yorker bought two of the Dean tires. His car crashed when both tires mysteriously blew out at the same time. The shell of the Dean car was being transported to a road safety exhibition in Salinas when the truck skidded and crashed. The driver was killed. Stolen from the scene of the fatal accident was the shell of James Dean's, James Dean's car. It never, it, it's never been recovered. There's another version of the disappearance of the shell uh, re as reported in a Los Angeles Times article on the 30th of October, 1989. George Barris was quoted as saying the last time he saw the shell was when he exhibited it in Florida in 1958. The car was loaded on the truck afterwards, but eight days later, when the truck arrived at its destination, the car wasn't there. No mention of an accident, unquote. The Snopes article ends without any fact-checking with a comment, you decide. Was that the end of the story? Not quite. In 2005, the Volo Auto Museum in Volo, Illinois, put out a million-dollar offer for the car around the 50th anniversary of Jane De James Dean's death. But by comparison, in 2016, a preserved Porsche 550 Spider was sold at auction for $6 million. It's time to change subject to the Hope Diamond. Here is a description from the website Live Science, and I quote, Diamonds have fascinated my mankind for centuries, and it's not surprising that folklore and superstitions have arisen involving good and bad luck associated with them. One of the most spectacular gems in the world is the Hope Diamond, a beautiful blue diamond weighing over 45 carats. About the size of a walnut, this stone is estimated to be worth a quarter of a billion dollars. 
However, there are many people who th- would think twice about buying it, for it is said to be cursed. The dimensions of famous gem are length of 25.6 millimeters, width 21.78 millimeters, and depth of 12.0 millimeters. So in U.S. customary units, that's approximately one inch by seven eighths of an inch by half an inch. 45 carats, about a third of an ounce or about nine grams, with the stone being described as fancy dark grayish blue. The diamond has been made into a pendant surrounded by 16 white pear-shaped diamonds, along with a chain with another 45 diamonds. But where did the Hope Diamond come from? According to the website Mental Floss, in an article entitled 10 Victims of the Hope Diamond Curse, it was cut from an even larger diamond, the Tavernier Blue. The story goes that the curse began with the Tavernier Blue, which was the precursor to several large diamonds, including the Hope Diamond. Take this with a grain of salt because it's never been proved. Jean Baptiste Tavernier stole the 115.16 carat blue diamond from a Hindu statue where it was serving as one of the eyes. Upon discovering it was missing, priests put a curse on whoever was in possession of the gem, which has included a fair amount of people over the years. Who was the first victim of the alleged curse? Jean Baptiste Tavernier himself, apparently. Here's a count from Mental Floss, and I quote, The story goes that French gem merchant Jean Baptiste Tavernier came down with a raging fever soon after stealing the diamond, and after he died, his body was possibly ravaged by wolves. However, other reports show that he lived until the ripe old age of 84. The next supposed victim was a royal. King Louis XIV bought the stone from Tavernier and had it recut in 1673. It was then known as the Blue Diamond of the Crown, or the French Blue. King Louis died of gangrene, and all of his legitimate children died in childhood, except for one, though that wasn't necessarily atypical in those times. Once it was part of the French crown jewels, it should have been locked away and safe, not to be sold. But wasn't there a revolution in France? Not quite yet. The next supposed victim was not a royal. Nicolas Foucault, who worked for King Louis XIV, is said to have worn the diamond for a special occasion. Shortly thereafter, he fell out of favor with the king and was banished from France. The king then changed the sentence to life imprisonment, so Foucault spent 15 years in the fortress of Pinerol. Some people believe that he was the real man in the Iron Mask, but other accounts dispute this. So who was number four? Four and five. King Louis XVI and Mary Antoinette. They were executed during the French Revolution. Who was next to die? Mary Louise, Prince Lebel, the, a member of Mary Antoinette's, Antoinette's royal court, who apparently wore the diamond. She was brutally killed by a mob during the French Revolution. I think we're up to number seven. Yes, that was a jeweler. Again, from the website Mental Floss. Wilhelm Falls was a Dutch jeweler who recut the diamond again. His son ended up murdering him and then killing himself. How did the Dutch jeweler William Falls get hold of the diamond? The diamond was stolen during the French Revolution. William Falls was given the task of recutting the diamond. I think we're up to number eight. Yes, and now we are in modern times, and the next supposed victim was Simon Maocardes, again from Mental Floss. Greek merchant Simon Maricardes owned the diamond. His curse? He drove his car over a cliff and killed himself, his wife, and his child. I think by then a dime would have lost quite a bit of value given the serious effect it seemed to have on life expectancy. So who was number nine? Number nine was Evelyn Walsh McLean, a person that didn't seem to care about the history of the diamond. One again from Mental Floss. Evelyn Walsh McLean was a spoiled heiress who lived a charmed life until she bought the Hope Diamond. She happily wore the diamond, and there are even stories that she would affix the jewel to her dog's collar and let him wander around the apartment with it. But wearing the Hope Diamond came at a steep price. First, her mother-in-law died. Her son died at the age of nine. Her husband left her for another woman and later died in a mental hospital. 
Her daughter died of a drug overdose at 25, and she eventually had to sell her newspaper, The Washington Post, and died owing huge debts. Evelyn's surviving kids sold the diamond to Harry Winston. Nine years later, Winston mailed the gem to the Smithsonian for $2.44 in postage and $155 in insurance. The quote didn't mention that Evelyn died of pneumonia shortly after her daughter's death. The Harry Winston mention was a well-known jeweler. Winston wasn't afraid of any type of curse. He just wanted a national gem collection. He donated the diamond in 1958. Well, that must be it. The hope the diamond is locked away in the Smithsonian, so there can't be a number 10. Unfortunately, yes. There was another supposed victim. Finally, from the Mental Floss website. James Todd, the mailman who delivered the diamond to the Smithsonian, apparently had his leg crushed in a truck accident shortly thereafter. He also suffered a head injury in a separate accident. Oh, also his house burned down, end quote. But other possible victims alleged curse have been reported from other sources. But we'll continue discussing the Hope Diamonds and then get into the psychic insight and the questions after the short break. And you're listening to Too Good to Be True with Justina Marsh and Pete Marsh on the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond. You're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. ABS Media. You have heard of the Exxon? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world, interactive online network, and much more. Tomorrow's TV today, Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365 Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the Word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, 
a hereafter, and son of God. And finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we were discussing the Hope Diamond and the unfortunate accidents that happened to the owners and people around the Hope Diamond. Yes, um, we probably don't have any much more time for too many more victims or alleged victims. Prince Ivan Kanovskoski and Sultan Abdul Hamad, Hamid II are other supposed victims. What happened to Prince Ivan Kanovsky? From the website, all that is interesting. And I quote, Prince Ivan Konovsky was one of the early owners of the diamond. Immediately following Jakuz Colette, Konovsky was killed in a revolt by Russian revolutionaries in the mid-1600s. End quote. The Jacques Colai mentioned apparently became mentally ill and committed suicide. What about Sultan Abdul Hamid II? Again, from the website, all that is interesting. Abdul Hamid was a Turkish sultan who owned, owned the diamond in the early 1900s. His entire reign was plagued by misfortune, rebellions, and unsuccessful wars. Abroad, he was known as Abdul the Damned. We haven't mentioned how the Hope, Hope Diamond got its rather ironic name. From Henry Philip Hope, who purchased the diamond from British monarch King George IV. We have probably have missed out on a few of the supposed victims. I think we have mentioned enough individuals to make a point. The Hope Diamond is now one of the most popular exhibits at the Smithsonian. But I think it is time you ask the first question, starting with King Tut's tomb. Starting with the discovery and excavation of King Tut's tomb, how did the idea become set in people's minds that the pyramids were used as tombs for the pharaohs? Basically, they based it off what they already found. So they based it off of the different bodies and burial sites they already found. It didn't have an explanation for the empty rooms. So they connected all the different rooms to the bodies they found. Did Lord Carnarvon tear open a mosquito bite while shaving, resulting in death by blood poisoning? That was part of it, yes. Why wouldn't Lord Carnarvon's medical condition be? Why was? Why couldn't Lord Carnarvon's medical condition be treated? Basically, because it was not fully in the medical books. Did all the lights in the house go out when he died? Yes. Was there any connection between Lord Carnarvon's death and the excavation of King Tut's tomb? Not directly, no. But there was a connection. Is there anything you can say about the connection? Basically, that there was a connection back with his death, but it was not a direct connection. And also that basically it was his time and his life chart, but that his death was suspicious and will stay suspicious for a while. Did Sir Bruce Ingham receive a paperweight as a gift from Howard Carter, consisting of a mummified hand from King Tut's tomb? Yes. Did Sir Bruce Ingham's house burn down, burn down after he received the gift? Yes. Was the house flooded when Ingham tried to rebuild it? Yes. Were any of these incidents related to the excavation of King Tut's tomb? What can be said is that it's not a smart idea to bring back the artifacts from King Tut's tomb and the pyramids, especially if it's related to the people buried there. Why did financier and railroad executive George J. Gold die of pneumonia a few months after visiting King Tut's tomb? That was unrelated. Why did Aubrey Herbert, half-brother to the Earl of Carnarvon, die of blood poisoning following a tooth extraction only five months after the death of his half-brother? That was partially related to his half-brother and goes back to something that is not in the medical books. Was there anything odd about the two half-brothers dying of blood poisoning, or was it just a coincidence? It was very odd, yes. It's related back to something and their blood being triggered. So it was not just the small actions of the bite and the tooth, but there was more to it than that. 
experts would have to study the blood in more detail, and it goes back to the different tomb and something being triggered in their blood. Why did archaeologist Hugh Evelyn White, who had visited King Tut's tomb, hang himself in 1924? Basically because he had a lot of pressure on himself, and we want to be sensitive to a situation, but he had a lot of pressure and saw a lot of things he could not cope with. So basically, in short terms, he was not able to handle his circumstances. Is that why Hugh Evelyn White wrote a note including the words, I have succumbed to a curse which forces me to disappear? Basically, yes, in his own words, yes. At the time of Hugh Evelyn White's death, had around 24 of his fellow excavators already died? Yes. Was that related to being in King Tut's tomb? Yes. During a house fire in Baltimore in 1926, why did Aaron Ember's wife encourage him to save his manuscript, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, only for him to perish in the fire? So the problem, again, is bringing back things from the pyramids is dangerous, and so little is known about the pyramids. So bringing back items and putting them in your own home is not a very smart idea. And she was a very smart lady and had an inclination that something was going to happen and the manuscript had to be saved. Why wasn't saving his son up his priority rather than his wife's priority? Basically just because of the people's choices and nothing too strange. It's just what they chose. Why did Aaron Ember's wife's son and the family maid also die in the fire? It was part of their life chart and just what happened. Did Aaron Ember believe in the curse of King Tut's tomb or the curse of the pharaohs? Yes. And you said his wife did too? Yes. Was Richard Bethel, Lord Carnarvon's secretary, found dead by smothering in his room at an elite London gentleman's club? Yes. Without naming names, who murdered Richard Bethel and why did they murder him? Basically some information that they wanted and some objects so it was to acquire this information and objects and when he wouldn't give it they decided it was best to kill him so it wasn't because of being in king tut's tomb but it was a criminal act is that correct yes did richard bethel's murder follow a series of mysterious fires in his home which had stored some of the priceless artifacts from king tut's tomb yes why did sir archibald Douglas Reed, who, who x-rayed the mummy, gets sick and died three days later. The mummy had something bad on it, and it affected him. Some kind of biological agent? We really would not call it a biological agent, but instead you could call it a dust or chemical. So it's not something alive, but something that has been long dead, but it affects humans still. So it was toxic? Yes. Were there any artifacts taken from the tomb that have remained secret, undocumented, and not known to the public? Yes, many. What is the reason for that? Is it a matter of greed? Yes, and hiding the real purpose of the pyramids. Who else involved in the discovery and excavation besides Aaron Ember believed in the curse of King Tut's tomb or the curse of the pharaohs? Many different people, so a lot of more small-name people who were very afraid of the tomb and many refused to go in it, especially the locals. How Carter and Lord Carnarvon's daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert, were present for the opening of the tomb. Why were they able to live out their lives in a normal manner? Because they weren't actually touching a lot of the artifacts and weren't inside the tomb like the others. Why weren't Howard Carter and his work recognised by Carter being knighted as Sir Howard Carter by the King of England? Basically because the King decided not to, so it was nothing particular, but it didn't seem that important to a lot of people. Why were both Howard Carter's and Lady Evelyn Herbert's remains both interned in the same cemetery in Putney Vale, London, England? There's not too much reason behind it, just that they were. There is really not a strong explanation. They just were. Changing subject to James Dean's car, did fellow actor Alec Guinness warn James Dean not to drive his new car about a week before the fatal accident? Yes. How did Alec Guinness receive the premonition? He just used his intuition, and you could say it had a gut feeling. 
Why was the warning given by Alec Guinness? Was it intended to prevent James, James Dean's death at a young age? Partially, yes. And he really did believe something was going to happen. Did Alec Guinness normally receive premonitions or did this happen on only one occasion? There were other ones he received, yes. The Porsche Spider's vehicle identification number was 550-0055. Was there anything significant about the number only including fives and zeros? No, it was just a strange coincidence. Why did James Dean change his mind at the last minute to drive the car to the auto rally in Salinas, California, rather than tow it? Because he thought it would be silly not to drive it, so he thought it was the smarter decision. Was the Porsche speeding just before it collided with the Ford, attempting to turn left onto Highway 41? Yes. Why did the driver of the Ford only receive minor injuries, whereas James Dean received fatal injuries? Just the angle the car accident occurred. When the wrecked car was delivered to George Barris's yard, did it roll back off the truck and break a mechanic's legs? Yes. Did Troy McHenry, a Beverly Hills doctor, buy the engine from the wrecked car as a replacement for the engine in his own Porsche? Yes. Was the replacement engine from James Dean's car in Troy McHenry's car when it crashed in 1956, killing McHenry? Yes. Was it the first time Troy McHenry had taken out his Porsche with a replacement engine from James Dean's car? Yes, it was. I think we have to go into the break now, Justina. Yes, we'll continue with the questions and the psychic insight about the James Dean's car and the Hope Diamond after the short break. And you're listening to Too Good to Be True with Justina Marsh and Pete Marsh on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xcpn.net. Zone? Now watch it on Simul TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. The concept of a new age has been around since the late 19th century, yet much of its original meaning has been lost. What exactly is the new age? Is it a religion, a collection of obscure esoteric practices, a series of doomsday predictions, 
or an astrological event. The New Age Chronicles is a unique, complimentary publication bringing reason and grounded information to separate fact from fiction. Chuck full of valuable information to support you as we make the monumental shift into the new era. You won't want to miss a single innovative issue. The New Age Chronicles newspaper is coming soon to www.newagechronicles.com. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And um, before the break, we we're going through the questions and the psychic insight, and we were just talking about the James Dean's car wreck. So, Dad, can you please continue with the questions? Sure. Did an unnamed doctor buy the transmission from James Dean's car? Yes. Was the unnamed doctor later seriously injured in a car crash while driving a car with the transmission from the Dean car? Yes, he was. Did an unnamed New Yorker buy two of the tires from the Dean car, some from James Dean's wrecked Porsche? Yes. Did the unnamed New Yorker's car crash when the two tires mysteriously blew out of this out at the same time? Yes. Was the shell of the of the Dean car being transported to a road safety exhibition in Salinas when the truck carrying it skidded and crashed? Yes, it did. Was the driver of the truck killed in the accident? Yes. Was the shell of James Dean's car stolen from the scene of the fatal accident? Yes. Was the shell of James Dean's car last seen by George Barris when he exhibited it in Florida in 1958? Yes, and it has now disappeared. So there were two stories. One that it was stolen from the scene of the truck accident and then disappearing in Florida. If both are true, how did George Barris get the shell back to exhibit it? Basically, the shell disappeared from the accident, then went to different sellers and crossed hands from seller to seller. Where is the shell of the car now? It's in storage, basically from an unknown person, so it is just sitting in storage. Why is there such a value put on the remains of James Dean's car? Because of the superstition behind it. So the car seems very special, that it seems that any piece of it leads to death or some type of destruction. So that is very interesting that a physical object could cause such negative Im impacts. How could a physical object, a car, have such negative outcomes? It goes back to the episode where we were discussing physical objects and how that certain entities are attached to those objects. So there are entities attached to the car, which basically stay with the car and the pieces. So it is not the physical objects themselves, but the entities themselves. So why was James Dean and the other people victims? Basically, the negative entities are already there. So they are stuck with a physical object. So it's just like the dolls where the entities are part of the objects. So basically, to get rid of these negative beings, you would have to get a specialist to do it since it is basically attached to the parts, so it's an unlucky situation where it ended up in extreme circumstances. Was the shell of the car stolen and stored away for safety reasons? Yes and no, and also greed, so it was kind of both. But it is in storage and safe there now, which is the good news, but basically this is a unique circumstance which does not happen often. Without James Dean being an owner, would a preserved Porsche 550 uh, spider be anywhere near as valuable today? Yes, it would be very valuable. Changing subject to the Hope Diamond, what were the circumstances of the death of Jean-Baptiste Tavernier? Did he die soon after stealing the Tavernier Diamond? Yes. Was the Tavernier Diamond connected to, all, to, to at all to the death of King Louis XIV of Gangrene and the deaths of all but one of his legitimate children? No. Did Nicolas Fouquet, servant of King Louis the Fourteenth, wear the diamond for a special occasion, after which falling out of favour with the king and being banished from France? Yes. Why did he fall out of favour? He did something very wrong where he lost the trust, so it was all his own wrongdoing. Did Fouquet spend 15 years in the fortress of Pinerol? Yes. Was Fouquet the real man in the Iron Mask? No. 
did the executions of Louis the Sixteenth and of Marie Antoinette during the French Revolution have anything to do with any diamond? No. Did the death by a mob of Marie Louise Princess de Lamel, who was a member of Marie Antoinette's royal court, have anything to do with any diamond? No. Did Wilhelm Fals, the Dutch jeweller who recut the diamond, have a son who ended up murdering him and killing himself? Yes. Did any diamond influence those events in any way? No. Did Greek merchant Simon Meonchardi's own... Sorry, I'll start that again. Did Greek merchant Simon, Simon May on Charides own the Coke Diamond? Yes. Did May on Charides drive his car over a cliff and kill himself, his wife and his child? Yes. Did the hope did that diamond or any other diamond influence those sad events in any way? No, that was his own conscious decisions, unfortunately. Did the Hope Diamond have anything to do with Evelyn Walsh McLean suffering the misfortunes of her mother-in-law dying, her son dying at the age of nine, her husband leaving her for another woman, later dying in a mental hospital, her daughter dying of a drug overdose at 25, and loss of ownership of the Washington Post? No, that had nothing to do with any diamond. Did Evelyn Walsh McLean die of pneumonia due to sorrow after her daughter's death? Yes, and grief is very hard on the human body, and her events were very, very unfortunate, but cannot be blamed on any physical object. Were any of these misfortunes in any way connected with her ownership of the Hope Diamond? No. Did James Todd, the mailman who delivered the diamond to the Smithsonian, have his leg crushed in a, traffic, in a truck accident, suffer a head injury in a separate accident, and have his house burnt down? Yes. Were any of these misfortunes in any way connected with handling of the package Hope Diamond as as the delivery? No. Was Prince Ivan Kanadovsky killed by Russian revolutionaries in the mid-1600s? Yes. Was his ownership of any diamond in any way connected to his death? No. In the early 1900s, was Turkish Sultan Abdul Hamid plagued by misfortune, rebellions and unsuccessful wars? Yes. Were any of these misfortunes connected to any diamond? No. Were there any persons that we haven't mentioned that were owners of the Hope Diamond or its predecessor who suffered great misfortune? There were others, yes, but it was not the diamond's fault, no. So during the time that the diamond was in ownership and was very in the spotlight, there were many accidents and incidents that happened with the different people. So yes, it seems like it could have something to do with the diamond, but a lot of these people had ownership of, of other very expensive items. So it was not the diamond. Basically, it was not the diamond's fault. What, what can we learn from the alleged curse of King Tut's tomb? That, that there still is a lot unknown. So there is different technology these days that scans an area and sees if it's safe or not. However, they are not always scanning for the right substances. And there are different substances that cannot always be detected since there is so little known about chemistry and more to learn. So with regards to the pyramids and different tombs, is that the Egyptians were very smart people. So they made sure that if their body was going to be moved or if artifacts were going to be stolen, that there would be a negative impact about it. So they were very smart and needed to protect the pyramids. And a side note about the pyramids, there is little known about the pyramids, and if someone does research about the pyramids, they will find there is a lot of information that is not clearly stated in a lot of documentaries, but has been found. What can we learn from the alleged curse of James Dean's car? That some physical objects just need to be basically put away and dealt with in a positive manner, but not used for future use. In this case, it was very unfortunate what happened, but sometimes it is best to listen to other people around you and listen to their intuition. And also with the car, there's always a statement that you have to make sure everything is safe with the car and expect the car, since cars are very convenient, but also very dangerous in any form. What, we, what can we learn from the alleged curse of the Hope Diamond? That sometimes physical objects are blamed for different events, but there is no real connection between the physical objects and the events. The diamond is obviously very special, but no, it is not causing any unfortunate accidents, and the different owners all had very unfortunate deaths or incidents happen to them. 
However, to own the Hope Diamond, you had to be a certain type of person. The most unfortunate incident was the delivery driver, as you stated, was related back to the Hope Diamond, but it was not the Hope Diamond that was related to the unfortunate accidents. That was the last answer. Is the Hope Diamond just a diamond too good to be true? That depends on what you are prepared to believe. I think we need a final shout out to the listener who suggested today's three urban legends. Yes. So a shout out goes to that listener. And as always, you can always contact us at our Facebook page at Too Good To Be True with its first two spelled T-W-O or at our website, TooGoodToBeTrue.net. And you can contact us there with suggestions. If you have other urban legends, if you want us to cover more topics, maybe about Egypt, maybe about strange cars. I don't know if there's any other diamonds, but maybe some other diamonds. Yeah, um... I guess we could talk about the crown jewels. Um, They all look fake to me when I've seen them behind the armored glass, but uh, I'm sure they're real. Um, There could be some some bad actors amongst those. Um, I don't know. Um, More urban legends are always fun. Um, I think the the three we covered today were the big three in terms of uh, any urban legend. Yes, and there's always a lot of topics to cover about Egypt since there's always so many different urban legends with the Nile River, with the pyramids, with different, I mean, the Sphinx is in Egypt. So there's so many different things about that. So if you have any subjects, you can contact us there if you have any comments on today's show. And as always, thank you for listening to today's show. We appreciate each and every listener and stay tuned for next week's show. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. 
He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464.